it's the 5th of August 2021. We take up this practice, this mental training, in order to take our minds out of all suffering. And so this um, suffering, this dukkha, that if we contemplate that with our mindfulness and with our wisdom, then we'll gain an understanding of it, an understanding into this noble truth of dukkha. And so this is something um, that we should understand. This is what the Buddha taught. Dukkha is something that we should pay attention to, that we should come to understand. So this dukkha, it's a feeling of being ill at ease, both mentally and physically, and also wanting something but not receiving that, that is dukkha. Or in this present day, we see there's a lot of separation that's going on, separation from the things that we find pleasing, and this is dukkha. Husbands are separated from their wives, wives from their husbands, and parents from their children, children from their parents. This is dukkha, or close friends and companions, and people that we love, we find uh, pleasing. And there's a lot of separation from these that's going on. And uh, so we see that, and this is due to this war which is taking place, this war of the COVID virus. And it gives a lot of dukkha, a lot of this suffering. As people need these four requisites for their existence to live their lives, it's not possible for people to just stay still, um, to not move. But they need to be active, need to go and search for these uh, requisites, for these supports for our life. And it's possible that they contract this virus due to that search. So this too is dukkha, a dukkha in the body, dukkha in the mind. These are all issues or matters of this noble truth of dukkha, of discontent or suffering. And the Buddha taught that if we gather all these together, that really attachment to these five khandhas, these five aggregates, carrying them around, that this is dukkha. And that's what the people in this world do. They carry around their bodies and the feelings and perception, mental formations, and sense consciousness, these five khandhas. And they shoulder these and carry them with them everywhere that they go. And they are happy with this. They're satisfied in this act of carrying these things around. And they want to get more and more of them. And that's what this craving does that it likes more and more. We want to attach to more and more. The more that we have, the better. But the teachings of the Buddha, they go in the exact opposite direction. They taught us instead to put things down, to give things up. And that laying aside that which is heavy, that is happiness. And so we put aside, we put down these things that we consider to be ours, things which we consider to be good and beautiful and long-lasting. And this view that they're good and beautiful and long-lasting and that they are possessions, this is the view of the kilesas, of the defilements. So the Buddha saw this, saw that carrying these things around, these five khandhas, that they're heavy, and picking them up, shouldering them, that that's suffering in this world. And that's what causes all of us to suffer, is because we shoulder these heavy burdens. We carry around physical things, we carry around mental things. And that's what this craving in our heart pushes us to do, to carry these physical and mental things around. And all we experience then from that is suffering. So the Buddha also taught that those noble beings, those who have gained some stage of awakening, the Aryas, they have laid down these heavy burdens. And um, they've put 
They put these things down to some degree that in the first stage of awakening, the first stage of nobility, um, that they've laid aside this heavy view of self and changed that view into one of seeing things as not me, not mine. There's still some attachment there that's left. It's not like they've abandoned everything at all. But their minds have become noble and they've become disciples, true disciples of the Buddha. So this path that can take us to abandoning these things, to heavy, to laying down the things which weigh down our hearts, that burden our hearts, is that we need to see the drawbacks in them. We need to see the drawbacks in carrying these heavy things around and see how they really do weigh a lot. They really do burden us. And if we can actually see that, then this putting down, laying these things aside, that happens all by itself. That we don't need to tell ourselves to do that. So all of us have experience of this. We're carrying something heavy, and then we put that down. And then we feel the lightness of that. And so it's the wisdom which tells us that that this is what we need to do. We need to lay this thing aside. And if our hearts are imbued with this panya, with wisdom, then they'll be able to let things go. Seize that all of the emotions, all the feelings that come up, that these do weigh down our hearts. So Lung Pu Cha, he gave a very simple teaching about this. That there was someone who came to see him who had a very heavy heart. And it was like Lung Pu Cha knew what was going on inside him. So he asked this man to pick up a bucket. And the bucket was filled with something, probably sand. And he said, well, carry this. And then... Nabucha went to talk, went on to talk about many different things, talk about this and that, until this man felt at ease. And uh, he was so absorbed in this conversation that he kind of, he forgot that he was carrying this bucket and he didn't put it down. And Nabucha, he asked him to carry it, so he just carried on carrying it. And then Lumpur Cha stopped talking and looked at him and asked, Well, isn't that bucket heavy? And the man said, Well, yes, it is. And so he asked then, Well, if it's heavy, why don't you put it down? And so wisdom arose within this man's heart, and he saw that the things which we attach to, that they are heavy, that they burden us, so if they're heavy, then why shouldn't I put them down? And so he was able to put down the bucket, and at the same time he put down all of the feelings, all these heavy feelings within his heart as well. And this wisdom arose from listening to the Dhamma. He saw how things are heavy due to the fact that we cling to them. But if we let them go, then lightness appears. The people who don't know this, who don't understand this, they just carry things around with them all the time, just keep on doing that. So when we have the good fortune to be close to wise people, then we can listen to their dhamma, their teachings. And having listened, then we contemplate, and wisdom arises, and we're able to put things down. And this may initially be Tatanga Vimuti, this temporary liberation. That if our minds have samadhi, then wisdom can arise and we can be able to see the Dhamma. And so this happens when the mind is in a state of, of quiet and peace and stillness. And that we know that these things, they're not me, they're not mine. And this knowledge can appear uh, very clearly within the heart. And that it's, it's not right to take it as a self. It's not right to take it as me, as mine, that that's not correct. And these kinds of feelings can come up within the heart when it's still. And any emotions which appear, then 
um, there's knowledge that this emotion is not me and this emotion is not mine. And we see how these feelings, they arise from the proliferation of the mind and from our delusion as well. And the sense of me and mine, us and other, this comes from our own proliferations. But if we have mindfulness there, they'll know that we'll know that there's tr- not any true us nor other, and we'll be able to let these things go and meet with genuine happiness. And here inner joy can arise, this joy which comes from the mind which has let go, from the mind which is imbued with wisdom. And when the mind is in the state, then we'll have a knowledge which is up to speed and knows all of the Sankara's conditioned phenomena as we experience them. And so we'll see the nature of all of these physical um, conditions and all of these mental conditions, see how they are unstable and changing, see how they are dukkha, see how they're anatta, not self. So this word dukkha means that which is difficult to endure. And so we've all probably contemplated before and thought, well, what things in this world do actually endure? Is there anything that really lasts? And there isn't, is there? Is there anything which doesn't change at all? Well, there isn't. So when we contemplate um, with wisdom, then we'll see things in this light that there isn't anything which stays like that forever, something which never changes, that everything needs to change, everything arises and then ceases, and wisdom comes up. So it's possible for us to develop and give rise to this wisdom within ourselves as well. But for this to happen, we need to have trained our minds first. For this cleared knowledge to come up, we need to have trained ourselves. And when this knowledge arises, then we'll be able to abandon the three lower fetters of self-view, uh, skeptical doubt, and attachment to rites and rituals, these three fetters. And these are the first, these form the first barrier that we need to destroy. So all practitioners want to know the Dhamma, and they want to see into the Dhamma wants to get to the state where there's no suffering at all. But even though we wish for that, um, every day we suffer all the same. And then we go and cling on to that dukkha, that suffering, and take it that I am suffering, that it's my mind which is suffering. And it's the power of delusion that um, gives the mind that attitude, that view that makes the mind attach to all of these physical and mental things, and so suffering appears. And so really the heart and the state is full of these kilesas, of these defilements. And sometimes there's anger which appears, sometimes love, sometimes hate, and the mind is never in a state of ease. And then in this world we have to compete with one another, and that's just the nature of the world to be that way. So it's important for us to train our minds, to keep them mindful until peace arises within. And we should find a method which works for us um, to give rise to that inner peace. We can try and figure this out, try and study, do some research, um, analyze. So just like how um, all of the medicines which have been created and the vaccines that people have found, um, that they've been able to find these, they've been successful in this, um, due to the effort that they've put into that search. And so we should do this as well. We should study, we should analyze, and ask ourselves, why is it that this mind attaches to things as being me and belonging to me? And where does it attach? What things does it attach to? We see that when we eat food or we drink water, we contemplate that as well and ask, is that really me? And uh, this food, it's just a, an element of nature. 
which changes following causes and conditions. And the person who eats that food also changes following causes and conditions. And the whole thing is just conditions, these physical conditions that are not me, are not mine. But when this condition of the body is in a complete state, um, then the mind will gain, will be able to cognize that and gain feelings from it. And then these mental things, these mental phenomena occur, such as vijnana, the sense consciousness. And so there can be jaku vijnana, uh, the sense consciousness of the I, uh, that gives us the feeling of sight. But when there's this feeling of sight, then we understand that I am the one that sees, that the mind attaches to vijnana and takes it as me who sees. But the Buddha taught that it's merely vijnana, it's not me, it's not mine. When there's a form and there's light, and these contact uh, each other, and then that light goes into the eye, um, then there's, and then the eye, the nerves in the eye, if they're functioning, then they send that signal, then the feeling of sight appears. But if there's no form, or there's no light, it's just dark, then no feeling of sight comes up. Or if the nerves in the eye are damaged, um, then even though there may be form there and there may be light there, still no feeling of sight appears. But when that feeling does arise, when that sight does appear, then there's attachments to that that I am the one that sees. But in reality, there's no self there. There's no me or mine there. When there's a me who sees, then there'll be a me who likes or dislikes that sight. But if our knowledge is up to speed with this process, if it's wise to it, then it will know that it's just that way, that it's just what it is. And then everything's done, it's all finished. That it's merely form, it's merely mental phenomena, it's merely sight. But to get to this point, that depends upon the time that we put into this practice, and it does take time for wisdom to arise. It needs to have come from causes that we've put in in the past. So just like how we're coming together every day to train, to meditate. And we use these principles that we've learned um, in our meditation practice. And so for the monastics, it's important for us to really train and practice as well, to do this a lot, to develop this path a lot. And in the beginning, it's difficult for everyone, but no one finds it easy. But as we carry on practicing, then we'll gain a deep understanding into the Dhamma. And if our minds are in a state of peace, then this understanding, this contemplation, is something which happens with ease. But if we're lacking inner calm, then everything's just stirred up, it's all chaotic. So we need to try to give rise to this inner peace. And this calm, it relies upon the foundation of our virtue, whether it's the five precepts, the eight precepts, or 227 precepts that we take up. And then we contemplate into the nature of physical and mental phenomena, all these things that the mind attaches to, that it shoulders, that cause it suffering. And we see how all of these things, they deteriorate with each passing day, that none of it stays forever, none of it lasts. So we can ask ourselves, or everyone who's here, everyone who's joined in to this session, in 50 years, how many of us will be left? And with every day we see many, many people are dying. Many of these are dying through illness, through this virus. And even if they don't die due to this illness, 
then we can ask, well, in 50 years' time, how many people of our generation will be left? And most of them, almost everyone, will have died already. But if we're not yet dead, then we shouldn't be heedless. And we should try to give rise to, or we should try to develop and cultivate our barami, these spiritual virtues. Because it's just not sure, and we don't know when we're going to pass away. But we should ensure that before we die, that we see the Dhamma, that we sincerely practice the Dhamma. So we have this uh, bariyati, the theoretical kind of study and knowledge, and then the uh, patipati, the practice, and then pativeda, the results of that, which is the knowledge which appears within the hearts. For this knowledge to arise, it requires our persistence, our determination. So we shouldn't just abandon our determination. We do a lot of walking and sitting, meditation. We put our effort into maintaining our mindfulness. And we see, or if we can do this, if we can maintain this mindfulness, then we can uh, perceive how these five khandas really are heavy things. And then we can let them go. And so this is something which it's not all that difficult to do, putting down these heavy burdens, these five khandas, if we have wisdom. And so we should contemplate and use our wisdom to investigate into the nature of all physical and mental things, seeing how they arise, they stay for a bit, and then they cease. And in the end we can see the Dhamma, and we can do this within this very life. So we should be determined. And this is something which isn't outside or beyond our efforts, something that we're capable of doing through our efforts. Because the Dhamma is revealed already, this nature of change, of discontent and of, of uh, anatta, of not-self, is revealed and opened already. It's just that the mind which is covered over with delusion doesn't see things in this light. If we are able to gain samadhi, then this delusion becomes a bit distant from the heart. And then we can contemplate and see clearly, and the mind can become empty and transcend the world. And when it's relieved from this pressure of attachment, then this emptiness arises and joy and happiness arises within the heart. And we see the nature of reality. So we should just carry on trying, do, trying to do this frequently. And in the end, we will see with clarity and it becomes more and more clear until our doubts are relieved. And then one day, the mind can just gather together. And perhaps this happens while we're listening to the Dhamma. And that's what happened for me, um, that I was listening to a Dhamma talk and my mind just gathered together. And I was able to see everything as being anatta, as not self. And this rapture arose within the heart and stayed there for three days and three nights. It was an unforgettable experience. I could see clearly into the nature of everything that surrounded me, seeing it arise and cease. This yana, this uh, knowledge uh, arose. So for all of us it's possible for yana to arise within our own hearts. And perhaps we may not think that it's going to happen, but it comes together all the same. In the Dhamma, it's akaliko, it gives its results um, without being constrained by time. But before we get to that point, then sometimes when we practice we're peaceful, sometimes not. Uh, but we should ensure that we're generous and that we're virtuous. And then we come to sincerely uh, devote our hearts into cultivating uh, this mental cultivation. And so we just carry on doing this, and then it's possible that the mind will just gather together, will see into the nature of anatta, not self, and the mind becomes empty. 
And then at this point, the mind changes. It changes from its previous state. And it just doesn't have any desire for anything, anything in this world. And because it sees that the Dhamma is far more valuable. It's the most valuable thing. So the clarity of a diamond, it just can't compare to the clarity of the Dhamma, to the clarity of a heart that's imbued with the Dhamma. So we should endeavor to train our minds and to be practicing so that this Dhamma arises within our hearts. This Dhamma which is able to free us from all suffering. And as we practice, this happens little by little. So may you all set your hearts on practicing in this way, in every day. <laughs>